Okay, everyone, so today is hydrogen atom. This is the day, this is the longest day of the year. Not because of the sun, but because of the number of equations that will stretch across the board. I don't know that I can always get them across the board and like that's it. I think I have to like sometimes do it twice. And I'm going to have like four or five of those. The reason is, is that as we start the hydrogen atom, I'm going to write out the Schrodinger equation. We know that's mostly the kinetic energy operator. Now we've, we've been talking about 3D kinetic energy rotational spherical coordinates. It was already pretty long and now it's going to be a bit longer. We're going to do the separability thing. That means I apply the wave function. That even makes it longer. Then we're going to have miniature Schrodinger equations and then we'll look at the solution it's solved in the 19, I think this one was solved in the 1920s. Um, I mean, I know that that's when this was first, the Schrodinger equation was introduced then. And Schrodinger didn't start with free waves. That was kind of interesting. Started with the hydrogen atom. Like where we end, that's where they began. But then again, you know, all these guys got Nobel Prizes, so maybe that's sensible from their world, from their perspective. Uh, and, and that will be about as far as we get today. So I'll try to keep it down to about 45 minutes. Um, I know that we're near spring break, so this is, when I first taught this, when I did this class for the first time, like, I don't mean like in general, I mean like this very lecture, the students, the next time we met said, look, we didn't get any of it, could you do it again? All right, now, that's fine, I did it, you know, because they wanted me to, so I mean, I'll do that kind of stuff. Uh, here's my statement to you. Now, for one, I hope that I've, eliminated a lot of my own rough edges. I'm not saying they're not there, but hopefully I can kind of get it out a little bit better That's because I've done it about 10 times since then. So I think that's fair. From your perspective, and something I've also stated, this stuff, the best way to learn it is to watch it over and over again, hence videos. I told you I've been doing these videos long before COVID. That's one of the reasons why. With spring break coming up between last lecture and this lecture, Watch it again, watch it again, and then watch it again. At least twice. I think all of you are going to have to watch it at least twice. And not speeding it up either. Speed up through this part, all right? So I think you get it. The best way to get this down is to watch it a few times. Recall that nothing is particular. Recall that we have a way of doing this. We write down the Schrodinger equation. Um, we can look at the various parts. The solutions, we're not actually solving things anymore. We did for the freeway, but now we're just taking the solutions from, a, from an 18th century math textbook or a paper. We then look, we then get the energy, and then we look at the wave functions and figure out what else we can figure out. We have a mechanism that we've repeated over and over again. This is the last time of this, but hopefully you're used to this. So, so you know how we're going to go about this. The next thing to note, and I'll start here. So reviewing from uh, 3D rotation, uh, last lecture was the spherical harmonics, the solutions. Uh, recall that, I know that this goes across the board, and again, you're gonna see it's gonna even get worse today. But reality is, it's at any given moment, you're just derivative, okay, instead of an x, there's a theta. Okay, if that's a deal breaker, then Good luck, <laughs> all right? But, but if not, if you can deal with the derivative of theta versus x, there's just, look, there's just two of them, all right? So you got a d theta sine theta d theta, all right? And, and we've covered how to deal with that on your previous homeworks. And, and you have last lecture. So the fearsome thing is just, it's just that it's just repeated over and over and over again. And that certainly does complicated things. It does complicate it. Of course it does. It, there's more. But that's the extent to which it's complicated. This isn't some new, you know, this is a derivative. Derivative of sine is cosine. It's the same thing you've known for since high school. It, this is not some new calculus thing that you've never seen before. So my point to you all, all of this is doable. It's just you have to do it over and over and over again. Okay. Anyway, if, if that was a pep talk, that's that. Again, we're getting into hydrogen, but let's do a little review because you need that. And, and again, this is my, my way of forcing you to watch it over again. 
uh, review from three-dimensional rotation. And let's see, there's no potential energy, right? The three-dimensional rigid rotor is a particle on a string, so R is fixed, and um, it, there's no potential energy. So we had, uh, uh, you know, when we did 2D rotation, it, it was just this, and this ended up just being E to the I M V. Uh, this was as easy as our free wave, which hopefully, remember I even said this to you, I said, you're gonna look back on free wave and say, oh yeah, that really wasn't a problem at all. Uh, and so, and then we did this guy, and hopefully you, you just saw that instead of the X, I had a phi, and, and it was just as hard as it was before. But when we add a dimension, when we start, you know, letting things rotate, though, we started letting them twist, right? Remember how I was doing this last time? Uh, and we have theta to describe how something rotating will twist. Yeah, it got a lot more complicated. <laughs> things got out of hand real quick. Okay, anyway. We separated, we acted, uh, we always, we have our base layer kinetic energy operator, I'll just write Hamiltonian. You have the total wave function on the left, you act, oh, sorry, you act on the right, you divide by the left. And, and again, we're doing this again today with the hydrogen Hamiltonian. Okay, and that's what this is. And we're looking for separability, we're looking for this to look like a bunch of stuff with phi plus a bunch of stuff with theta equal equal to hopefully zero because that's that certainly sounds easy and we did that we had some terms with uh, phi and then we had a bunch of terms with theta not mind blowing but one part is really kind of interesting you know the only thing I think I'd say that's like legitimately fascinating is that remember that these are designed to spit out energy. The energy ends up with a theta term. So we have a miniature Schrodinger equation with phi, which we know the solution from the 2D rigid rotor. And then we have the theta guy that we also have to solve. Uh, and, and once we have that, we have the energy. And notice the energy gets funneled into the theta miniature Schrodinger equation. That makes it like the alpha. You know, this theta is alpha, beta, uh, and uh, phi is the beta. So the alpha one will solve for the energy. Okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. If this is the phi and we know the wave functions, then this part is minus m squared, and that means that all of this is plus m squared to equal zero. So you set all this to equal to m, squ uh, m squared, and we, again, we talked about this last time. You can set, we know that m is zero, one, two, three, and Simon uh, de Blas, whatever his name was out. That was the guy's name, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, 1782. Uh, simply plugged in m of zero, m of one, m of two, and then solved it. I don't even know how. And those wave functions. So it was. So this is separable into a phi and a theta wave function. We call those spherical harmonics. Uh, we tend to give these a different symbol. I try to minimize that in this class. All these introduction of new symbols, but I, it happens. And for the hydrogen atom, I'm probably going to end up accidentally writing this out this way. Whenever you see a Y, if, if, if you are in my world, this is what I do for a living, you see a Y, it's automatically a spherical harmonic. Spherical harmonics come up in a bunch of stuff. That's why it was solved in 1782. They'd already run into, they are, they had already run into this for something else. So that's why it was solved. So I see a Y, I know I'm talking about a spherical harmonic. Remember an S state, an M, L of zero, M of zero is just a constant, and you saw, you know, S state spherical wave functions. L of one, that's a P state. M of zero is a PZ, and that's N cos theta. Uh, and then it gets a little bit more complicated, and those are tabulated. I know I gave you that chapter 14 of that quasi textbook I'm still working on, so you saw that there. All right, now, our goal is uh, we're going to adapt this to the hydrogen atom. Before I do that, because again, this is a bit of a bear, I want to just stop for one second and tell you a little bit, tell you something else that's kind of interesting. Now, at the end of last lecture, right, I reminded you that this is, um, that's, that's our 2D rotation, but when you do 3D, you're talking about this type of motion for an m of zero, and then you've got an m of one, and I can't do an m of two. Just to remind you that 
you know, these all, these are all talking, describing about something just whizzing around. Okay, so I don't think it's that bad. And, and I showed you a little bit about that last time. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I want to point out that there's another type of spin here. I'm going to save the board for the, the next part. So, so let me call this other angular momentum. So there's other types of angular momentum, which is called spin. Okay, now what spin is, is let me give you a little demonstration. I was looking for a soccer ball, and I couldn't find one because my lab doesn't have soccer balls in it. Not, not one that I liked, so I grabbed this instead. Okay, now again, I have been, so here's the electron, and, and I'm the axle. Remember, my body's the axle. That's the J. Uh, if I'm doing 2D, it's a JZ vector. And, and I'm rotating around. And again, I've done this a zillion times. Hopefully you're sick of this. But here's the crazy thing. Spin means that the electron is rotating. The electron is rotating by itself. Now, we're not actually sure that that's what's happening. Spin is a type of angular momentum for an electron, and protons do it too, that um, actually everything, <laughs> protons and neutrons do it too. Everything we observe about an electron by itself, it behaves as though it's rotating about its axis. Like, yeah, now you can see why I should have gotten a soccer ball, right? Um, or a basketball and spun it on my finger, which I could do that, but I just, I'm not, I just didn't find one. So, it's like the damn thing is just spinning on its own. Now, we're not sure that's what is really happening, but it's like that's what's happening. Now, as a result, it has a type of angular momentum. Now, the reason I brought this little pig was to show you that the, the description of the hydrogen atom gets complicated because, of course, it still has S and P and D states, but the electrons are spinning aside from that. This is another type of angular momentum. So let me let me demonstrate what that means. Now again, you've seen me spinning the, the electron around, but it's also doing this. So you see, you see there's two things happening at once. I'm turning around, and the pig is also turning around. Now, okay, so again, not, not the hardest thing to, to you know, get. Notice though that, um, all right, so I've been doing the pig this way. I've been rotating it, you know, the, the way I've been rotating it. But you notice that I could have also done this, right? I could have spun the other way. This is m minus 1. I was doing m plus 1, now I'm doing m minus 1. All right, so you notice that the pig is like rotating against me. Before, we were like rotating together, and then the other way we were like rotating against each other, different directions. So, just to remind you that that's a thing, and that's going to come up later. Uh, so spin, spin is like a type of angular momentum where the electron is spinning on its axis. Although we don't think that that's what it's really, really doing. We're not really sure what it's actually doing if that is actually like rotating on its axis. We don't think that's what's happening, but whatever it is doing, it behaves as though it is. I know that's really weird, but that's what's going on. Now, you've heard of this before. Uh, remember how, <laughs> let's do, uh, let's do uh, 1s, uh, 2s, right? It's freshman chemistry. I'm drawing a freshman chemistry electron diagram. Now, if you do hydrogen, you do this. But if you do helium, you do that. Spin up, spin down. Spin is what I'm talking about, right? The, the angular momentum. It has, um, for an electron, uh, the spin is one, it's, sorry, it's one half h bar, so it can be up or down, plus or minus one half h bar. That's how much angular momentum it has. Now, when in freshman chemistry, when you were learning about how to understand electronic structure of hydrogen and helium, and, oh, oh, lithium, what's lithium? Isn't lithium next? Anyway, so then you draw another one, and whatever comes next is spin down. The reason you do this whole spin up, spin down thing is that was the angular momentum. Okay, so uh, recall that if you do metals, if you do metals, remember that you have these more complicated 
uh, orbital diagrams of like, so this is like a DZ, uh, this is like a, a D state, so there's five states, and however many electrons you fill them up using the, right, the Ausbau principle, remember that? The, you, you add an electron, then you add a pair if there's uh, more electrons. So if I have three more electrons, I would do this. Uh, let's say I actually had one more electron, then I would do that. So, uh, so you've seen this before. Anyway, I just wanted to remind you of this. Let me tell you a little bit of Stephen Hawking things. Uh, you know, cosmology and all that. And I won't put this on the test or anything, but one thing that's kind of fascinating is that everything seems to have spin. I mean, I mean, should have a little minus there. Every, I mean, everything has spin. Electrons are spin one half. Protons and neutrons are spin one half. It turns out if you ever read any of those like Stephen Hawking types of Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you ever read any of their books, things with mass are usually like half, half h bar spin. And things that carry force are integer spin, zero or one. Spin one, that was, in, that was a light. Remember, how, remember, remember all this? Remember all this from a while ago? That question about why do you not have an m equals zero state for light? The angular momentum, the L of light, is one. Uh, the Higgs boson, I think that's an that's a angular momentum, the spin, spin angular momentum of zero. So, so you've heard of this stuff before. So particles like light and Higgs boson, you keep hearing about that, those have this type of, this other type of angular momentum of spin that are integers, that's generally zero or one. Uh, mesons, pions, those, those are like for the strong and weak nuclear force and whatnot. Anyway, those are also spin zero or one or what, what I, I don't even know. <laughs> okay, so tell you what, uh, that's enough of a review, enough babbling about rotating pigs. Let me uh, wipe out the board, and then we're going to go ahead and get into the hydrogen atom. And so we're, we're going to start out in a very similar manner as here, uh, and then we're going to do separability, and that actually should be, that should be enough to set us up for talking about wave functions next time. So I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So today, right now, we're starting on the hydrogen atom. Real quick, I wanted to show one little empirical thing before I start writing down all the wave, uh, sorry, Hamiltonian first, wave, fu wave functions next. One of the things that people started figuring out the quantum mechanics was a thing, was the, the re, I don't know if that's a Ritz or Ritz combination rule, I think it's pronounced Ritz combination rule. And so what happened was, oh here, I'll do the effect. Uh, so back in the day, we had vacuum, we started building vacuum chambers because of electricity, and you could put hydrogen in it. It's not hard to generate hydrogen gas by itself via electrolysis, again, electricity. And what you can then do is zap with electricity. You can zap like a lightning bolt through H2 and get H atoms. Now, there's a lot of energy imparted, so it's going to glow. You've just built the world's first spectrometer, and so instead of just white light, like what you pretty much expect, out came certain distinct colors of light. And that's like, you know, remember that back in the day, they see energy as continuous, right? Like, like our maxwell boltzmann velocities. Energy is continuous, and that means that when you shoot lightning at something, you would expect a continuum of, 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 of um, glow back, right? So, so fluorescence, fluorescence ought to glow kind of like what was put into it. If, if you have a lightning bolt go in, you kind of expect a lightning bolt to come out. You would expect a continuous spectrum of energies to come out, but that's not what they got. And, and that says that things are not moving with any arbitrary energy. And this is one of the reasons that quantum mechanics got to start, because everyone's like, well, that just doesn't make, Again, back in 1900, this makes no sense at all. It may make no sense to you as well, but hopefully not. You know, you've heard about these discrete energy levels. You've been hearing about these since high school, about 1s and 2s orbitals, but they, they don't even know about this stuff yet. So when they hit this damn thing full of lightning and out came specific emissions, this was absolutely antithetical to everything they ever knew about energy itself, which they thought they had a really good handle on at this point via thermodynamics. Okay, now the Ritz combination rule looks like this. So again, the emission from the spectrometer, um, so the energy of the photons that come out, have, they, they, they follow, uh, there's a constant, 
times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. Um, the n's are integers. Now you, have, you know enough math to know that means 1, 2, 3, right? And n2 is equal to n1 plus 1. Okay, so what's happening is, again, they're seeing quantized energy you know, states, and they're seeing that, um, it, that there, there's this pattern to it. Now, heads up, what this corresponds to, these are actually, they had experimentally discovered quantum numbers before they knew about quantum mechanics. What you're going to see is that, let's think about the quantum numbers we have. We have the M for the uh, phi uh, rotation. We have L for the theta type rotation. Now, now we're going to have a, a quantum number for the radial type of, um, I'm about to write down the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, and the radial part is going to be a miniature Schrodinger equation, and it's going to have a quantum number, and it's going to be the um, n quantum number. So they had discovered an n quantum number before they knew about quantum mechanics. And, uh, and you know about the n quantum number. n of 1 is the first row of the periodic table. n of 2 is the second row of the periodic table. n of 3 is, right on and on and on. You get to n of 3, all of a sudden you get to the d block, right? That's why, that's why you, don't, you don't have 1d or 2, 2d orbitals, you have 3d orbitals. All this, I hope that all this sounds familiar. You should have had it in high school in freshman chemistry. So this is basically a discovery of, of quantum mechanics, of what is going to be the result of the Schrodinger equation, which I'm going to put down now. Okay, let me start out easy. So here we go. I've been talking about it for 20 minutes now, right? Uh, I'm going to start out real simple, and I hope you remember uh, okay, so as usual, I have to write mass down because of, because we have that uh, we have that m quantum number now, which is so annoying. Now, mass E L that means mass of the electron. Just want you. I'm just doing that so that I'm certain that you know what I'm talking about. That's that's all I want to do. Now, now you may recall this symbol del squared. That is that's the kinetic energy, right? double derivative of x plus double derivative of y plus double derivative of z, right? And if we were doing Cartesian, that's what this would be. God, that would be so easy, but you know that it's actually going to be spherical. And so I'm going to write that down in a moment. Okay, now let me point out something that's a real biz knocker. I'm going to write down another kinetic energy. And I'm writing down h bar, sorry, h bar squared over 2 mass, mass of what? Mass P, mass of the proton. You see, the proton can move in its own right. And so it gets an operator. It gets, so there's kinetic energy with that. Now, what makes the hydrogen atoms stick together is, of course, Coulomb's law. Now, let's break all this down. Now, I hope you recall from Coulomb's law that the energy of attraction is the charge times the charge divided by 4 pi e naught and the distance between, which would be the radius, or in spherical coordinates. Okay, now e is not e to the zero, which is like 2.7 something something. E is the charge of an electron. We run into another problem with multiple letters. <laughs> e is the charge of an electron. Right. So, Coulomb's law is charge one times charge two. The charge of an electron is an E of charge, whatever number of coulombs that is. It's on your homework. The, and that's negative times the charge of a proton, which is also E, but positive. Negative E times positive E is minus E squared. Again, 4 pi E naught, which is a scaling factor. just makes the units work. The distance between the two is R, which is no longer fixed. Because the radius is no longer fixed, we are going to have a radial miniature Schrodinger equation, which will give us the n quantum number, right? Now, you, hopefully you've seen how all this, all this fits together. Okay, next bit. Solving the Schrodinger equation with this thing in here would be unpleasant and not really necessary. If you eliminate it, you can introduce like a 1% error to the result, and there's even ways to fix that. I won't really mention any 
I'll tell you, for those of you who just absolutely have to know, what you would do is, if you get rid of this, you can almost eliminate the error by changing the mass of the electron to the reduced mass of an electron plus a proton. Don't worry about it. Let's just say it's the mass of an electron. For those of you who absolutely must know the answer, get rid of this and turn this to the reduced mass of the electron proton system. However, the reduced mass is always basically the mass of the lighter particle, so I'm just going to call this the mass of the electron. The end result will be about a 1% error, and we're not that worried about it, right? We're, we're, we're trying to understand fundamentally why our 1900 understanding is wrong. So, and, and we will be able to describe this. Okay, next bit. Okay, I'm gonna go across the board about four times, so heads up on that. Okay. Now I'm just gonna write down, uh, I, 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 might, I might screw this up, two times mass. I, I'm not gonna write EL, right? I'm just, just, it's the mass of the electron. It's gonna say mass. Okay, but when I put a little subscript there, like an EL, that means I'm talking about an electron, but I'm always talking about an electron. Now, recall that these R's, I had gotten rid of them before because R was fixed in our rigid rotor, this and that. They are no longer fixed. I told you I'm going to go across the board. I told you it'd be long. You know, you thought the 3D rotation was bad. Well, I've got some more stuff here. Now, you may recall that the moment of inertia was 2 times the mass r squared. So there's that r squared, and that means here comes the angle stuff. And, uh, and I'm not separating anything. Now, you may recall that when we did 3D rotation, I've got a phi and a theta, and that's bad. And you may recall how I got rid of it. I did that by multiplying everything by sine squared. Uh, we'll we'll see that in a minute, but right now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm writing down things exactly as they should at the first step. I haven't I'm not doing any uh, factoring or anything else like that. So so again, this is exactly what the kinetic energy operator looks like. This is exactly it. I've not done any surgery on it. I've not simplified it. I mean, I've definitely not simplified it. Look at it. Oh, and I've got two brackets. That's, that's something, isn't it? All right. Oh, <laughs> now, I'm just, now I'm looking at this like, wait, where am I? Okay, so then here is the potential energy. All right, so um, player two has entered the game. I've got a potential energy. Okay, so this is the operator. <laughs> you know what i got to do next? I got to, I got to operate, I got to add the wave function, right? What we're going to do is separability. So then, then I'm going to have to operate on the wave function. Okay, before I do that, before I do that, I want to do, this is part of your homework, but I want to simplify this a little bit because, are you kidding me? Why would I not want to simplify it? Okay, so I'm just going to write this down. Um, let's see, uh, let's see. So minus h bar squared over 2 times the mass, mass of the electron, bracket. Okay, now, and I'll go ahead and tell you how to do this. It's on your homework. I've actually got a couple of these on the homework. What's happening is, all right, I'm going to write all, I'm going to speed up time, I'm going to write all this down. I've turned these two terms into one term. Now, the way that this works is these two terms and this are the same thing, right? Remember when we talked about Jacobians? I can't just make this up, obviously. These are the same thing. Now, the way you would know it is you would take this, apply a wave function, so I have an R times a wave function of R, and then I've got a, a, a double derivative. Now, clearly, I'm heading for a product rule that would split the single term into two terms, these two terms. Okay, so I just wanted to tell you, I'm big picture. I'm simplifying this. This is that. They're the same thing. And you could know it by applying a dummy weight function here. And you can see that you've got a product rule situation. And product rules always turn a single thing into, you know, two things. 
And you can see that right here. Okay. Let me speed up time and write, and let me just power through this. There we go. I've been doing this too much for me to be able to write that out that fast. Anyway, what, um, let's see, what do I want to say about this? Um, so I guess we have to now think about what we're going to do, which is that we are going to apply, we're going to apply a wave function. Okay, let me, you know, I'm going to do what I did last time. I'm going to have like an instruction set for like what I'm doing. So I'm going to apply uh, a wave function and I'm going to write it kind of compactly, r theta phi uh, on the right and Let's see here. I, uh, you know, I'm going to have to wipe over what I've done here because, because I, I really have problems with space. Okay, so, so what does that mean? I'm going to, I don't need to wipe that out. Let's see what I'm doing here. So I'm going to apply wave function r theta and phi. So I, I erased this because I didn't give myself enough room. Okay, so I mean it's it's like stupid at this point. I just wrote down wave function r theta phi, but you know that what why it gets more complicated is because now I've got an eigenvalue equation. Now I've got e, uh, I've now got an e on the other side, e of wave function, right? So this is the eigenvalue equation. Okay. Um, oh, so I know I'm not. I'm not, I'm not uh, using the board too well. Let me write my instructions set above. Sorry about this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is mult, mult. I'm going to multiply by these constants and r squared. Now, it's like, why am I multiplying? Am I, is that right? Yeah. Minus 2 mass h bar squared times r squared. Now, uh, note that I've, you know, Multiply by h bar squared over 2m? No, 2m over h bar squared, right? So that's going to wipe this out. And I know that, uh, you know, if I'm just trying to get rid of the constants, why am I multiplying by r squared? Because in like five minutes, it's going to save me a bunch of trouble. I don't know how they ever figured this stuff out, but they did, and I can show you from the very beginning what the cheat, what the cheat code is. Okay, so now what? Oh god, now I <laughs> got. Okay, it, it always does, you know, it actually does it a little nicer. Um, when, you, when you get rid of those constants, well, I didn't get rid of them, but it does look a little bit better. Okay, so maybe I should speed up time. I don't know if I tell you about the cats. Um, it looks like, okay, you know what I'm doing here? You see how I've got all R's? Now I've got some angles. And these haven't really changed. I'm going to have to toss this up in a minute and make sure that this is all correct. Okay, and these are all, of course, uh, there's a wave function to the right of them. And I haven't written it out in a separated form yet. Function of r, function of theta, function of phi. Um, Okay, then I still got the, I still got this field here, and it's a little com more complicated because I multiply by two times the mass. Um, I multiply by r squared divided by r, um, and that leaves a factor of r. Uh, multiply by okay minus, so that's plus two mass h bar squared. Then I've got the four pi e naught. Okay, so this got a little bit uglier, but just got to gonna have to just deal with it. And next bit to look, <laughs> uh, to look more like an equation that mathematicians and, and you know I told you I, I kind of like this. I like to bring this energy over to the other side, and so I see my mass again, two times mass. Uh, r squared, my multiplicative factor. Okay, when I bring over energy to the uh, from right to left, it's minus e psi, but I multiply by a negative, so now it's plus 
the multiplicative factor energy uh, and the wave function. And I, sorry, I didn't write those in order, not that it matters. It looks like I have hit, okay, I got it just right, didn't I? Okay, so, so actually look at that, I did not quite I did not quite have to spill over to the second to the second level, but I, it was it was close, right? Okay, now now we're going to start on separability. <laughs> I know we haven't even started yet. We're close. The thing is, I can tell it's going to work out. Remember, separability means that I have to have terms with only R. Look at that. There's a term with only R right there, here, and here. These terms do not have theta in them. Well, maybe in the wave function, but we'll divide that out. So it looks like I've got the R separated. And notice that the energy is in with the R's. So, so we're going to have a miniature R Schrodinger equation, a radial Schrodinger equation, which will have the energy. That makes it the primary Schrodinger equation. Now, the beta Schrodinger equations, you see that I've got just angles right here. Just angles. So I've got my angle part Schrodinger equation, miniature Schrodinger equation, which, by the way, looks uh, identical to uh, it looks identical to the spherical harmonic thing that we just did at the beginning of the lecture, let alone the last lecture. So here's a miniature Schrodinger equation. I think I know the solutions. I bet those are the spherical harmonics. So they have to be. This is the exact same thing. And once I solve that, then I'm going to funnel that information down to the alpha Schrodinger equation, the primary Schrodinger equation, which has R in it, the radial one, and I'm calling it the primary, the alpha, because it's going to give me the energy. Okay, so, so I just want to pump that out. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have to wipe out the board. I'm going to wipe out the board, and then we're going to do separability. So give me one moment. All right, so now here's the idea. Now we're going to start on separability. And I'll write my instruction set up here. So what I'm going to do now is um, I already know that the, the theta and C bits are going to be my spherical harmonics, my little, remember my little Y thing I showed a, little mi a moment ago. So I'm just going to go ahead and say I'm going to have a radial, and I'm not going to try to separate Actually, why not? Why not? I'll just I'll write it out the way I should. And I'll just write that out as an R theta and a C. Three different wave functions multiplied. Okay, so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to be doing this. Now, I'm not writing out R theta C. Just, you, you should know this, right? So this is the separability field. We act on the right, divide by the wave function on the left. And we need to see blah, blah, blah with an R. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, sorry, plus blah, 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 with a theta, plus blah, 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 blah with a phi. Now, we already know that we're going to see uh, stuff with theta and phi because we've already run into the 3D rigid rotor problem. So it has the same solution. It, you know what? Let me write it out, and you'll see. So I'm going to take that monstrosity on top, and I'm going to divvy it up. Now, this time I am, I am going to write this on two, two levels, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, I'm not, um, I am not simplifying anything yet. You know, I don't know that I always write theta and phi in order. I, I probably screwed that up. So, but you know, function one times function two is function two times function one. So I'm glad that I'm going to split this up into two, <laughs> two planks. Okay, so there we go. Maybe I should have sped up time. I don't, maybe, maybe I will. Okay. So here's the angle parts. Uh, wave function acted on the right and divided out on the left. And this is just the angle part. So now, now I have to add in on another level. Now I have to do the radial parts. And again, here 
is what that's going to look like. And, uh, you know, I, uh, just so you know, I've technically done more than one step of algebra going from the top to here to here. I'm actually doing about two steps of algebra. I'm doing that because I don't really think that you're going to be able to just like write this down off the top of your head. That would be pretty unreasonable. I hope that you can follow along enough to see that this all looks similar enough to make sense. Um, but I, I wouldn't expect you to be able to write all this down, let alone solve it, which I don't even know how Schroeder did this back in 1922 or 23. Okay, so again, so I'm doing the separability thing. Now our deal is so big it stretches across the board twice. Well, it doesn't quite stretch across the board, but it's long. Okay, I've got a bunch of thetas and phi's up here. So, uh, so the blah, theta, blah, phi, I've, I've done that. And then I've got another bunch of stuff with a bunch of R's, and the R's have energy in it. So this is like going to be my alpha, my alpha Schrodinger equation. So I've got miniature Schrodinger equations where I've got a new primary one, which is R, and that will give me the energy, which is what I want. And I can solve that Reed's combination rule and all that stuff if you do that. OK, now. Now, I've written it this way for a reason. I'm going to do something kind of funky, but it's just the best way to try to get across to you what's going on. Now, let's not worry about, um, I, you know, I had to multiply this by sine squared, and remember all that from last lecture. I, what I'm seeing is, I'm seeing the 3D rigid rotor, the top one with the angles. It's the same thing as a 3D rigid rotor. I could go about redoing all that and, you know, sure, or you can just watch the last video. So why don't we just assume that we already know exactly what this looks like. We know the wave functions are, and we know the eigenvalues and all that. So I'm going to erase that plus, and it turns out that this is going to be equal to minus L times L plus 1. Right? A quantum number. A quantum number. Now, it doesn't quite look exactly like, uh, you may have recalled that this, uh, the, the whole shebang was equal to the uh, two times the moment of inertia, I'm sorry, minus two times moment of inertia over h bar squared, sine theta squared, energy, energy was L times L plus one. All right, so it doesn't quite look exactly the same. Where's my constants and why is there a minus sign? Well, that's because the constants are actually right here. Remember that, so this is the only thing that's actually kind of hard about this, is that at the very beginning, when I took the h bar squared over 2, minus, sorry, minus h bar squared over 2m, and I multiplied it all out to the right, they're now here. They're now in, they're now in the alpha Schrodinger equation, and so they're not in the, um, the sub Schrodinger equation. That's why it doesn't look like 2 moment of inertia over h bar squared, it looks a little different because because those factors that made it look that are, are actually right there right now. Okay, so if these sum together are zero and this part is minus L times L plus one, then guess what? Then this is equal to plus, I'm not gonna write a plus. You know, the absence of a sign means it's plus, right? You know that. Okay, so notice that. Uh, again, assuming that my beta Schrodinger equation, my, uh, my, my sub Schrodinger equation is solved using the 3D rigid rotor, this and that, Laplace and all this, then my primary, now I funneled everything down to my primary Schrodinger equation, and now you just got to solve this. Now we already know that L is a quantum number for rotation. And it takes on the value 0 for S, L for, I'm uh, sorry, P is a 1, a D is a 2, and F is a 3, F states, D states transition metals, P states, that's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, 0, that's your hydrogen and helium. These are rows of the, you're right, good, sorry, yeah, S, P, D states. Okay, so what you have to do is then you plug in, you plug in 
zero, one, two, three, and then you, you go from there. Then you solve that. You solve that from there. And uh, let's see here. Um, so let me write that out, and then we're going to stop because I, I see them at time. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is my instruction set here for what I'm doing is uh, we're going to do some algebra. We're going to multiply by minus h bar squared over uh, 2 times the mass. We're basically undoing what we did before. Uh, so, and then I'm going to factor psi of r. Now the reason I'm doing that is I want this to look more like a traditional eigenvalue equation. And then we're going to stop. So anyway, given all that, that factoring, so multiply by 1 over r squared, so r over r squared is 1 over r. Um, now again, I am doing this just so I have what looks like a more typical Schrodinger equation, eigenvalue equation, which a 1920s, the original report from Erwin Schrodinger has the solution. Whatever, I just go look it up. I don't have to solve it. I have no idea how he solved it. Plus one. Um, of course, it's multiplied by the wave function. Almost there. Remember, e squared is the charge. Okay, so so again, this is our operators on the wave function, and of course, it's equal to the energy times the wave function. It, sorry, energy. What's wrong with me? See, I'm out of it right now. I mean, this this is a lot for me, even. And I'm looking at notes. Okay, now I see that I'm out of time, and I'm actually I'm kind of done. I just want to point out big picture. We wrote out the whole 3D kinetic energy operator for the Schrodinger equation. We didn't let R get fixed. That's, that certainly complicated it. And we had a Coulomb operator. That also complicated it. That, those were our complications. It was enough to cause us to write this freaking thing across the, the board twice. Sorry. Um, fortunately, the angle bits come out to, we already, we already know the angle bits, and those funnel into a primary Schrodinger equation for R. That's what you see here. And being a primary Schrodinger equation, yeah, it's, it's long, uh, and, and we'll deal with that, and it gives us the energy. Now, we take it for granted that we go look in a 1920s report in some German uh, journal, that's true, and somebody actually solved this, and that's what we're going to look at next. So, actually, what we're going to do next time is we're going to start here, and we're going to like look at each individual term and understand why it makes a hydrogen atom does what it does, and then we'll understand how those individual terms result in the wave functions looking the way they do. And we'll have about two, three lectures on why each one of these terms makes the wave functions look the way they do, and then we are done with quantum. All right, I've got, I think I'm right on time, so with that, I will see you all next time.